Um, we're very excited to be joining all of you out there in talking about how we can translate online practice for the K-12 realm. Um, we're going to be sharing a lot of different strategies, a ton of resources to hopefully emphasize that, yes, you can do this. And we are here to support you in this adventure. Um, my name is Sarah Ackerman, and I've been in the field for a while. Um, at the moment, I am supporting the University of Missouri St. Louis by designing and facilitating online courses for art teachers. Um, prior to that, I was working with the Art of Education University, which some of you may know is an entirely online university for art teachers. But I've also worked with K through 12 um, in face-to-face, low-tech, high-tech, no, uh, just everything in between. Um, so I'm bringing a lot of different experiences to this presentation today. But most enthusiastically, I want to introduce you to my partner in crime today, and that is Carrie. Carrie, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, this has been a great opportunity to work to collaborate with this. Um, I'm excited about what we have to offer you. I'm currently teaching high school visual arts. I would say 90% of my day is on a computer. So I have some challenges kind of ahead of me, um, but I also come with some instructional coaching background. So that's kind of where I'm providing a little bit different background um, than with Sarah's online experience. But I think we have a lot of really good things to share with you and I'm really excited. Our goals for today is to show you some best practice to get you to kind of think in that online mindset because it is going to be a big shift. We want to share some examples from the field. We have tons and tons of resources at the bottom and I'm sure um, you've been able to find tons of things using different social media groups as well. Um, and then we have a checklist for you at the end of some recommendations, things to do. And just to let you know that we're there for you as you need some support. And then we're going to do a Q&A at the end. And if it hasn't been linked already, I just want to emphasize that this P, this PowerPoint presentation will be shared as a PDF and everything that you see is linkable. Um, so we're trying to create just one um, kind of one stop shop for you to get started with some basic things when it comes to shifting content online. I know that you're probably getting bombarded with content and information if you're following a lot of different um, um, social media pages and websites, but this is a nice little starting place for you. Um, when Carrie and I first sat down to start talking about this session and the things that you might need from us, um, I, we, I, I really get kind of aligned the, my concept of putting online courses together to working in the kitchen. Um, and so I came up with this recipe for success when thinking about best practices for shifting a very traditional face-to-face -face learning experience to an online setting. And this recipe for success is what's going to kind of outline Carrie and my recommendations for getting started whether you're just getting started with online instruction, whether you've dabbled with it a bit in the past or you're a seasoned veteran, just looking for some additional ways to amp up your online presence for students in this time. Um, these are the main ingred ingredients as we see it when it comes to shifting to an online mindset. That being a super intuitive, uh, user-friendly design, engaging content, and meaningful assignments. And these are the three things that we're gonna walk through with tons of examples in the next several slides with you. So to start out with, um, in terms of intuitive design, these are the things that I think about a lot when I'm designing my online classes for university students, but it's also what I think about in this time when a lot of you are shifting to an online mindset. The, the shift to online, it needs to be super smooth. It needs to be easy. It needs to be straightforward, not only for you to make your life easier and a little less stressful, but think about your students. They're shifting into a totally different mindset, as well as the guardians that are there kind of hovering over their shoulder, making sure that they're getting things done. Um, so on your end, 
making intuitive moves when you're designing online structures are super important. Um, think about all of the different classes that students are probably grappling with now in their home offices or in the kitchen table. Um, they're gonna have a lot of different subjects to plow through. And learners come with a variety of different comfort levels when it comes to technology. Um, and parents do as well. So this can feel super overwhelming, not just for you, but for your students. So we want to share some ideas now about of how this can look intuitively, it can work intuitively for your students and for the people that are supporting them in their learning. Um, in my current practice, we use at the University of Missouri Canvas as a platform, but I've used Canvas, I've used Blackboard, I've used Schoology, I've used Google Classroom, uh, you name it, I've been in it. And um, no matter the platform that I'm using, um, because every platform has different buttons and different ways they might, um, different nomenclature in terms of how they label certain tools and whatnot, for the most part, I've been able to do the same things across platforms. Um, I'm gonna be sharing examples from my current courses at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Carrie's gonna be sharing some examples um, using Google Classroom. Here you're looking at a Canvas template. No matter the platform that you're using to share your content with your students, it needs to be super clean and it needs to be super organized. So students aren't stressing about where to find things when, parents and guardians aren't confused as to where they need to go to make sure their child hits their to-do list for the day or the week, it's right there in front of them. And Carrie. Um, sorry, I'm like looking at the chat and looking at this all at the same time. Sorry, too many things, a little ADD. Um, when you're thinking about just different LMSs, there's some things that you need to think about and really make sure that you're adhering to the safety protocol that your district has put in front of you. Uh, making sure that the resources that you're using fit your age group. Um, and I would also just kind of do a double check with your district. Is this something that is district approved? I think that's really important. And is it something that's going through their email? Um, something like a Remind or like a Google Meet, something that's going to keep everyone safe so nothing comes into question, I think is really important to kind of keep in mind as we move forward instead of jumping on everything without kind of doing just a couple minutes of background research to make sure that it's safe for all students. And when you get access to the PDF with the, the slides here, um, anything in kind of this turquoise color and underlined is a hyperlink in the presentation. So the here button, that links to a great resource, which will point you to in the instance that maybe you don't have a common learning management system, LMS, within your school district, some other sources that you can use to streamline your communication to your students. The benefit, I believe, of course, of using an LMS with students is that other, other teachers, other faculty members are, are likely using that LMS as well, um, so that there's just that kind of running common thread um, in the online learning experience. So I'll jump back in here in terms of, you know, so you have a, a whether it's a learning management system, whether it's Google Classroom, whether you're creatively using social media um, or a website that you've created to put content out there to students, to families. Um, it, keeping in line with this intuitive design, I like to clearly label content into folders for students. It's sort of like, I, I think a lot of times in my mind, I'll go back to my middle school and high school self when I had binders for every single subject, right? And so I think of the online classroom space kind of as a series of binders. And my students, they have one binder, one classroom space for my class here. And I wanna be able to filter that information, organize it in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, so in the case of my particular classes, I am in a situation where my students work through content on a weekly basis. So we have weekly folders. 
Um, you might be in a situation where you have daily folders that you want students to pop into. Um, this is a zoom in of what those folders will look like, but say one of my students clicks on one of these folders, that's when that folder will expand and all of the content that the students that I want my students to engage with is inside of that folder. Um, now keep in mind, this is from an online course that started out as an online course. And so there are quite a few steps here. You may not have as many steps for your students. In fact, you probably shouldn't have that many steps for your students in this transitional time. Um, your folders could have something as simple as a, okay, here's an overview of what we're gonna do. Here's a video of me demonstrating what we're gonna do. These are the directions for what I want you to do as the student, and here's a place to share out. Um, so you might not have as many steps, um, but what I like about having a learning management system or a class website or a Google website is packaging, putting everything that a student needs to succeed for that particular week or day um, or lesson everything right there in their hands. So everything's super clear and accessible. When I think about how I design these folders, this is just another graphic to lay things out of how I see this from a, a curriculum development standpoint. I think of it as a sandwich. We're kind of continuing with this underlying theme of recipes and food, it's making me hungry. Um, but when I think about each of my course folders, whether you call them folders or modules, um, I think of them as a stack sandwich. So the top piece of bread is a module overview. Maybe that's an opening um, from you. Then I number tasks out and then there's an end checklist to say, hey, did you accomplish each of these things? This just teases us out a little bit more. You're gonna see some examples of how this can look how this looks in my classes, how this looks in Carrie's classes. Um, I think having an overall structure to the way you're adding content to the class is really important. If you can find a sense of consistency early on, that's going to help ease your students' minds, ease everyone's minds in the classroom. Something else that I really like about um, all learning management systems, not just Canvas, is the ability to access and utilize a digital calendar. Um, when I'm adding content to my weekly modules and when I um, set up a, an assignment, I set up a deadline when I'm setting up that assignment because I know if I set up a deadline, it's gonna pop up on a calendar that the LMS creates for me and for my students. Um, so this is a calendar just from my particular class. An added benefit of um, making sure that you're using an LMS, if you're using an LMS, the same LMS as your district, um, say a student logs in and their English teacher is using the same LMS, their social studies teacher, their science teacher, all of these calendars will come together on the student view side of things. So when a student opens up their calendar, they can see all of their deadlines and a parent can see all of their deadlines and help them keep their student, keep their child on task. I mean, I'm a digital person, so I pretty much live on the computer. But something I would encourage if you have the ability to print out a calendar, I think we're all going to be in a stage where we're a little bit stir crazy because we're spending so much time with the screen. I think having a physical copy of um, timelines and tasks will do wonders for both students and guardians to keep each other on track, even if you're not necessarily in a position where you're asking for hard deadlines, but you're trying to keep students in a, a certain role when it comes to engaging with content online. Um, another tip 
when um, my students and you're you're going to continue to see kind of snippets and snapshots of my particular classroom environment as well as carries um, i find that when i'm writing anything whether it is it is in directions for a particular task whether it's setting students up to engage with a particular article or video or website I try to be really succinct and really clear in all of my directions because here's the reality. You're not in front of your students anymore. Um, when you're in front of your students, you can read them in a lot of different ways. You can see that crinkle on their forehead and you can tell they are just not getting it or they're super confused. Um, something else to keep in mind when it comes to guardians and other people that might be helping students through their content, especially the little guys, you need to be a cognizant of that. So using language that's not super technical, but can be understood by a, a broad range of audience members. Um, I often joke that I can be a verbose Betty um, because I can be. And one of my biggest challenges is making sure, am I being succinct? Am I being to the point and as clear as possible? This is a big piece of feedback when putting anything online for students. Okay, here's a look at Google Classroom and I, I'm currently using both Google Classroom and Canvas because we haven't done our full adoption yet. So my studio classes have been mostly in Google Classroom, but I've really used them more for storage. So I'm going to have to basically provide some videos and really teach my students, okay, this is how we're going to use Google Classroom now because how we had been using it in the past changed. It's a studio class. I'm there. I'm popping things up it's a whole different ball game. So I really needed to have at the beginning, here's how I'm going to use Google Classroom. This is how it's going to be different than how I've used it in the past with instructions to check your email, make sure you're looking at the calendar, all those reminders that I was able to kind of give them in class if it was important. I need to make sure that I tell them kind of upfront how I'm gonna be using these resources. I added a topics. I know Deanna said something um, using that e-learning, you put that as a topic and then potentially look at breaking things down by week. Um, I have like a link up there with uh, directions of kind of a, a how to, I believe it's from Teresa, <clears throat> because you're going to find that students who haven't been using Google Classroom like a traditional studio class, they might not know, wait, how do I upload pictures? How do I add these things? So there's a link there that came from Teresa. My other point on this is making sure that you're using clear topics because uh, it could be siblings, it could be guardians that are trying to help them kind of navigate the waters. So make sure that you're really clear instead of putting week one, make sure that you're adding that date on there so that they know exactly what's to be expected. Um, one thing that's helped me as well is making sure that you're numbering assignments. Then they kind of know I go through one, two, and three. It seems like a simple thing, but it's just made a difference in my practice altogether. Um, and then this is something that came from Sarah is she had a wrap up at the end. I don't know if you noticed, but on her week, she had a, the beginning steps of what she was going to do. But then she also provided a weekly, like a, a wrap up checklist or potentially a Google form. Have you done these things and potentially checking in with your students? Um, I provided a check in at the beginning of the week. Um, but I think that follow up at the end with that checklist of things is also really important. And my checklist at the end, it isn't anything formal in my particular LMS. It's literally a, a page in Canvas with all of the steps that my students were intended to do. Um, it's a nice wrap up for students, but it also I find kind of um, bookends that particular module because students are going into folders for each week of content. I like to bookend. So I will start with a little summary and I'll end with a checklist. It creates kind of a nice transition in between content areas. Can you snip back one more? Oh yeah. Perfect, sorry. Um, this is just the example kind of my, of my check-in. 
Um, it was just a really simple thing, asking kids basically um, how they were, any barriers that they had at home. Are they taking care of siblings? <clears throat> Do they not have Wi-Fi? Are they having Chromebook problems? Did they leave their charger at school? Like some little things so that I could check in with them. And then I um, am currently following up with an email or an audio message in an email back to them so that they still have that personal connection. I think that's been really great. Um, and then there's kind of my calendar so that you can see a simple kind of just check in for where things are at. Um, I think the biggest thing with planning things out is really being consistent. I think Sarah sent the same message, but also be flexible. You have to remember, we have no idea what's going on um, in someone else's home. But I mean, I know how crazy my house has been and there's just we don't have any barriers currently, so kind of keep that in mind, being flexible. Um, my other point is, um, if you're bringing in a new tool, because I know there's been a lot of tools that have popped up, hey, we're offering this free, we're offering this free. If you're bringing in a new tool to your students, you need to do some screencasting um, and really be explicit to why you chose to bring in that tool and the things that you would be telling them in class, you need to make sure that they're hearing so they don't get frustrated, so they can see the importance of why you're doing that, I think is really important. When you're thinking about basically how you're gonna lay out, how the kids are gonna learn the information, you need to think about what's gonna be the best way for you to lay that out. If you've been consistently using HyperDocs, stay with that. If you've done a Google Slideshow, stay with that. Um, but you want to really look at how can you be consistent with your layout. So the one on the left is from Jen Morgan. She's using pages and laying out and sending her kids pages as to the activities that they need to do. It's something that they're already familiar with and it provides really clear steps. One, two, three, four. This is exactly what you do with the links directly in there. And she's setting up hers by day. So that's another thing that as you're thinking about your design? Are you communicating with students every day? Are you communicating with students by the week? Kind of some things to think about and some of that's going to depend on your district expectations. Um, the example on the right is what I sent out to my kids this past week for AP just to kind of get them thinking what do they need to do and I tried to be as clear as possible. I use a lot of tables so it's something that my kids are very familiar with, kind of how things work. Um, my other big tip here is when you're linking things, um, don't use the big long link. I don't know if you can see, but I use link here and I put it in cap so the kids know this is exactly where you need to go for the information. I think that's really important. And then as you hover over your things before you send them, just, just kind of do a double check to make sure that that website is correct. If you kind of hover up, that's going to pop up. So those are two different examples of really how you're starting to deliver that content to students so that they can interact with it. It might be less than what you've done before. It might be more depending on what that content is and what you need kids, to, how you need kids to interact with it. Well, and what I like about what Carrie's sharing here is, you know, we're kind of sharing all sides of the spectrum here from you've got access to an LMS Maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't, you're gonna try it out. That's the highest tech spectrum to this spectrum where it's, it's literally a Google Doc or a Pages Doc that's been hyperlinked. So a student or a guardian, a family member opens it up. Everything is still right there at their hands and at their disposal. They just click through things with your careful directions and your nicely, nicely hyperlinked everything. We're, what we're really talking about is thinking through the packaging of your content. Um, if you spend a little bit of time packaging, that's going to help ease the minds of so many people, including yourself. Here's another example um, of an assignment in terms of learning it, but also offering them some choice. The first ones that you saw were really just like an assignment here. This is kind of what you need to do for the day or the week. Um, Heidi offers a couple different options where she's looking at the menu board and that kind of gives you a sense of, well, you can do this small thing and then you have like kind of a main course and then kind of here's some fun stuff at the end. Um, so 
yikes, it didn't translate as well as I would have liked. So I will try to get the live link on there. So when we send it out to people and she's currently making some other things and she's a high school teacher in Maine working on things, but that menu works really well. And I think that would translate to any content area um, and any grade level pick, you know, one from this category, one from this category and one from this category. And then that gives some kids, it gives kids the ownership and some choice. <clears throat> um, this is the, I guess the package that our district is currently using as we start to look at e-learning. Um, what I like about it is the three words, learn it, practice it, prove it. And we're really trying to get everyone in our district as they're setting up their lessons to really think about how are you getting the kids to learn it? How are you practicing it? And then how are they going to prove it? So that we're all using the same language to help ease some of the transitions. Because if we start to all use the same language just within our building, as the students are seeing the materials, they're gonna go, oh, okay, this is my practice. Everybody's saying the same thing, I can do this, not a big deal. So that's just kind of the template um, that the instructional coaches came up with and we presented to the staff. I think it's a helpful way of really simplifying things and getting everybody on the same page with language. Um, here's an example from Deanna. Um, uh, she's currently looking at using Google Slides to have kids collect work because as you're thinking about, you've given the students these things, you want them to do all of this stuff, to learn all this stuff, to practice it. Now they really need to, th you need to think about, well, how am I gonna collect this back? And there's so many different ways when you're using an LMS or even if you're just using something really simple like Google Classroom, I or even an email, depending on what your limitations are, you really need to think about how are you collecting stuff from students? Because students are doing the work and they're excited about potentially doing it. You need to figure out how you can collect it. So, and then the other thing that you need to think about is, am I collecting the work individually? Like a student's going to have their own slide deck, they're gonna answer some prompts, they're gonna put some stuff in or they have a slide deck, or they have a hyper doc, or they're gonna email me, or do I need to think about how can I have them collaborate? Can you stick one ahead for me? Yes. Um, I do a lot of collaborative collection in my class um, because 90% of my classes are digital, so that collaborative collection works really well. Um, in this instance, I feel like it's a great way for kids in the classroom to still stay connected with each other as they start to do some of those things that they had regularly done. We regularly shared photo of the week. That's not, not something anybody wants to give up. I had students ask me, well, how are we going to do photo of the week? And I was like, I have a plan. They want some of that consistency that they've had. And I've been lucky as a high school teacher um using a google slide that's fully editable i haven't had any issues but i've also done quite a bit of teaching and talking about the professionalism that comes with using a fully editable doc if that's not possible and you're doing like an elementary and a middle you can still have some of that collaborative piece happening whereas students are sending you work you could potentially throw them into a slideshow and, or a Padlet and post some things so that students can see what other students are doing and then they can work on that feedback component. But then they can still stay connected to what other kids are doing in their class so they still feel that connectedness, which I think is really important. Um, before we shift totally into engaging content, I just want to jump on um, that very important comment that Carrie just shared in terms of connective connectivity. Um, I, if you're not a part of um, the online art teachers group, I'm going to link to that at the very end of our session here. Um, and that's a wonderful resource where people are just sharing so many wonderful ideas for this transitional period. And I recently shared an article that I read about this idea of social distancing and and really we're not we're not wanting people to socially distance themselves we are just wanting people to distance themselves physically 
Um, I am someone who thrives off of collaboration and in all of my online teaching situations, that's something that I've tried to improve upon with every class that I teach. How can I bring students and fellow faculty members together more often so we aren't feeling like these silos out, out there? And I think this is gonna become more and more an, an issue for our students who are, are at home with their families going a little bit stir crazy. So any which way that you can get students sharing their artwork with each other in some of these wonderful dynamic ways that Carrie has shared is a great thing. When my students are turning things in in Canvas or other platforms that I've used, I utilize the discussion board tool in the platform for students to share their assignments. Um, there's definitely a way, there's always a way within a, an LMS system for students to share assignments directly with you. Um, my philosophy is transparency. So students don't just share their work with me, they share their work with everybody so that everyone can celebrate the work that they're doing, everyone can look at the work, ask questions, give feedback. Um, and a lot of times there, you know, there's always going to be those students that go above and beyond and can kind of push the crowd in, in really dyna dynamic and interesting ways. And I think of all times, this is especially the time where we need that social interaction. So in, if you can shift things to um, public areas that are also safe for students to, I want to reiterate the safety factor here. The nice thing about working within an LMS, a school approved LMS, is that it is safe for students to share out. If you're working in a more public website space or over social media, you'll have to kind of rethink that to make sure that you're protecting your student information and student identities. So with that, Carrie, why don't we go ahead and shift from intuitive design and dive a little bit more into engaging content. And um, here we're really wanting to make sure that um, we're giving students access to us as facilitators, as teachers, but we're also being mindful that um, students need to hear from other points of view, not just us as the instructors, Again, kind of circling back on this isolation concern. Um, I want my students to hear a lot from me during this period when I'm teaching online, but I also want to make sure that other voices come into play, whether that be through videos, articles, other resources that I find online to back up the things that I'm sharing with my students, but also to kind of change it up for them as well. Um, especially in this period when students are, are in a period of stress and they're shifting into an online mindset, I want to make sure that every piece of content, every step in my weekly module folders are su super applicable to what they need to do in terms of the tangible creation piece. So every assignment that they create, the content that I provide prior to them completing that task, I wanna make sure it's on target and applicable. And um, something else, learners take in a lot more when they're enjoying the process. So if you can add some good flair to your content, that is always appreciated by the um, students. So when it comes to creating content, um, we've, we've talked a lot about so far how to structure or some ideas for structuring and organizing your online classroom space. Um, something I want to emphasize is humanizing. Um, you might have an awesome organized classroom space now it's time for you to put your face all over that space. Make sure students know that you're the person behind that content, behind that class, that you're still the person holding the reins of their learning. And by golly, you are still so excited to be holding those reins. So my students in my online classrooms, they, they, they might tell you that they see enough of Ackerman. Um, I start out every week because we work in a weekly modality. My students get a weekly update video from me. And sometimes it's like, like the computer here where it's just me and my face. 
sometimes it's like the iPad here where it's my face and I'm hovering over the class and I'm walking them through the expectations. It kind of replaces that, you know, after passing period, students sit down, they might have a bell ringer, but then after that, I'm running through the, co the content of the day, what we need to accomplish. Um, I'm replicating that experience in a video format. Um, so the, when you get access to the PDF here, all of these are links to resources that I use, that Carrie uses. I myself, I'm working with a Mac laptop on my end. I'm an Apple person. And when I'm recording videos on my Mac, I use QuickTime to create screen shares and movie files. And there's a really nice tutorial linked here. Um, Carrie, do you want to speak to some of the other tools we have? Um, I, yes, I normally use Screencastify. Um, because a month ago I decided that it was totally worth it. So I spent the extra couple bucks to get the full version so I could do some editing and add some things. But the bonus is now that there's a code floating around out there. Um, I will have to post it where you can get access to that for free so you're not limited. Um, I even have my students use Screencastify so they can go through a slide presentation where they're talking about their own learning and showing me different samples. So I use Screencastify not only as myself showcasing some stuff, but I also in turn then have students show me what you're doing in Illustrator, show me what you're doing in Photoshop. Um, and I really enjoy it. It took a lot to get the kids to realize that, hey, this isn't a terrible thing to do. It's kind of like the first time you use Flipgrid. Kids are a little hesitant um, but I found it was the best way to get a pulse on where your kids were really at because they could be a really good writer and totally have you fooled. Whereas with Screencastify, you can really hear them talk about their learning and either their enthusiasm or their boredom kind of with their work. So that's another way, I guess, that you could use Screencastify in a different mode. Um, Screencast-O-Matic works a lot like Screencastify. Loom is the same thing. They're all uh, really simple Google extensions that work really great. Mm -hmm. Well, and Carrie, you mentioned how you kind of hit on how important, I, I hit early on how important it is for students to see your face, but I think it's just, just as important for us to see our students' faces. I agree. Time frame. Um, I, for one, I every even though I've been doing video, video video videos for my classes for a long long time there's always that part of me you know you are your biggest critic when it comes to creating things like this and when it comes to my weekly videos I give myself a two video take limit so even if like my dog walks behind me in the background or if I mispronounce something and I need to reiterate it, I try to give myself a two minute limit because otherwise I would drive myself crazy creating video after video. And I remind myself, okay, if my if I were face to face with my students, they would get this sort of stuff in real life. So why not just let it unfold? Um, give yourself some grace when creating these sorts of videos and try not to go back and, and watch and, and critique yourself. I sound so much different when I'm speaking as opposed to when I'm listening to myself on video. Um, to give you an idea, I mean, you can do, you can do video with very, very little. Right now, we're, I'm just in front of my computer screen talking to you all. Um, but when I am getting a little bit more um, involved with this, I've got a couple things set up behind me. Um, I've got a couple of tripods. A lot of times I'll do video recording with my cell phone. It's amazing the quality of video that you can get with a cell phone these days. And even if you don't have a tripod or a sophisticated setup, I've gotten really creative with setting this up on a stack of books. Um, it, what's important is that you're getting yourself on camera. Um, and even if you don't have a tripod like, like here, you can still jerry-rig some things to get a bird's eye view so that your kids can see a video of you actually drawing on your tabletop. There's a lot of creative things that you can do. 
um, take the leap, start videotaping yourself as soon as possible, if not for that humanizing effort for your students. I totally agree. Um, this morning I saw it on one of the Facebook groups, someone had had a mug, like just a coffee tumbler, and on top of the tumbler, they had placed their phone and it was the perfect distance for them to record what they needed as they were doing a tutorial. Mm -hmm. So nice to see like, hey, we can kind of figure this out together online. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it, but that is the exact height that you would probably need. Um, I use Screencastify when I'm just sending messages out to my students because I'm able to just quickly use my webcam. I don't have to try to hold anything um, and it's really easy to check. So that's my bonus on that one. Mm -hmm. Well, and it doesn't have to be super complicated or long with these videos. I find that long videos are actually terrible for students in an online classroom setting. Um, I try to limit my videos to between five and 10 minutes and even 10 minutes is, is lengthy. So trying to, trying to shoot for around five minutes or so. Of course, there's gonna be some things that require a little bit more than five minutes of content. And in those situations, I chunk it out. So maybe students have two or three videos to watch from me or from another resource that I've found, but I've chunked that inf information into manageable pieces so that a student isn't sitting in front of their computer watching a video for 45 minutes. Um, think about the attention span there. Um, they're gonna get sucked away with something else. Um, and with the older students, you might have students that want to kind of click back through a video if they wanna revisit something. And that's a lot easier to do in a five minute video than like a 45 minute video. So that's a tip to keep in mind. Um, something, and here's another, uh, here's a screenshot from one of the weeks of the class that I'm, I'm sharing with you. It's a museum for art teachers class that I'm teaching, and I went out and I videotaped a lot of leaders in the field. And this is my good friend, um, Heidi. And the, the nice thing about using an LMS like Canvas or another LMS through your school is that you can it depends on what tools are, are available and have been linked within the LMS. So in Canvas, when I want to upload a video to my classroom, there's a couple of different tools like Panopto, like Kaltura. I could also just link it as a regular file. Um, but it's worth looking to see, before you just link it as a regular video file, it's worth seeing if there's other tools within your LMS like Panopto, because you can take advantage, in this case, you can see that automatic captions is a thing. Um, when I realized that Panopto automatically captioned video, you often have to go in and correct some things along the way. But this is going to be really helpful if you do have some students that have, uh, that need this. I, I remember when I was teaching at the high school level at Streamwood High School, we were the biggest population of hearing impaired students. So this is something that would have definitely been on my radar if I was doing regular videos, I wanna make sure that my hearing impaired students are able to get that content from me. So it's definitely worth exploring. It's not, Panopto is not the only tool out there that can do this. Um, so it may just take a little bit of exploration on your part. So when it comes to engaging content in my courses, it's they, my weekly modules are chock full of videos. I'm also bringing in other relevant resources like articles and websites that they can explore. And we're gonna share a ton of websites and resources in the upcoming slides. All of these things I'm linking directly in my course. Or if you're creating, as Carrie shared, some of those linked up um, Google documents or Word documents or Pages documents, what I like about what I, what I want to do for my students is put everything right there at their fingertips. So they're just a click away from a video, a click away from an article. We wanna make it so simple for students to access the content 
so they don't get lost along the way. Um, and other digital tools you can link throughout the experience. This is an example of a virtual gallery tour. Since everything's gone down with the virus, I've seen so many museums and other institutions rise to the occasion putting things online. We're going to share some of these things with you, including tours, read alouds, web quests, everything. This is just one slide. I'm not going to read through all of it because it's just chock full of resources. These are websites, these are applications, these are 3D tours of museums that would be wonderful additions to any curriculum. Something to keep in mind, and we've kind of labeled things based on um, how to best view this. So if it's an application, that's going to be an app that a student can pull up on their handheld device. If they're, It depends on a lot of things. Are you guys a one-to-one -one with iPads? Um, do student, did they come home with, um, with laptops? Are they engaging with content over their own cell phone devices? These are all of the things that you want to think about before selecting which, if any of these tools, will be applicable to you and to your curriculum. So that's going to be in the PDF for you. Um, here is just a simple lesson um, that I'm kind of prepping as we potentially go to e-learning or I guess navigate what comes next. Um, so I used just a simple HyperDoc. Again, I'm using HyperDocs and Wakelets. That's something that my kids are very used to. So they're going to understand exactly, I need to go to step one. These are the things that I do in that step one. Everything is really visually chunked for kids so that they can see exactly what they need to do. Um, I put a link to the lesson in the HyperDoc and there's also the Wakelet is also public. Um, I found that HyperDoc Gals have all of these great templates online for you to use. Really all it is is just Google Tables, but because it's chunked, it's broken up, it's a little bit easier to use um, and you can kind of figure out. I would say there's probably in that folder link that I sent, there's probably maybe like 10 different options for you to think through. And again, just like Sarah said, all those links that people need are right there. It's just kind of a click away and everything is packaged. In step one, I do this. The other thing that we've encouraged our staff to do as we start to prep for this is really put, I don't know if you can see it next to where it says learn it. Um, I added that five minutes so the kids know this activity should take you about five minutes. It's perfect for both level of achiever because then students aren't spending too much time and then the kid that isn't really excited about doing it, it gives them the opportunity to see, oh, this is only five minutes. I can do something for five minutes. It's totally doable. So really easy to kind of see like, yes, this is doable. I can do this for five minutes. So adding that time in your doc or in your um, in your LMS or however it is you're putting together your lessons, your packaging, I would encourage you to use that time frame because I think it's really important. Um, when you're working on content, really think about reflecting on the content that you kind of already had prepared uh, because you've already done all of the work. It's already there in front of you. You just need to look at what can I still do and what can I potentially still connect to what's going on here in the like here today currently so they can kind of comment instead of not talking about it. I think talking about it is is very real and very helpful for students. I would normally do a landscape lesson. Instead, I'm going to have them go on a virtual tour and take some pictures like I would rather be any place but here. So I wish I was someplace else. So it kind of is a fun look at landscape and then letting them do some choice with media materials. But also doing some different tours from national parks and getting them to engage with the material a little bit differently maybe than they would have before. All right, so that's a great segue to our third section, meaningful assignments. Um, I think we are definitely in a period where we need to practice patience with ourselves and um, give ourselves a little bit of a break when it comes to curriculum development. But at the same time, 
um, you're probably thinking what I'm thinking. We want to still make sure that our students get a particular um, subset of skills and practice in order to stay relatively on track when it comes to that bigger scope and sequence of your courses. Um, so thinking through meaningful assessments, knowing that learners and maybe not all of our learners, but many of them are going to have high expectations for what you're going to offer them in the online space. Um, learners are practical and results oriented. They appreciate strong examples. I think this is particularly true for the parents and the guardians when they are oftentimes going to be probably a bit of a translator of the content that you put out online. Being able to see an example, an exemplar of what your students, what you hope your students will create would be really helpful. Um, and also keep in mind that learners enjoy collaboration when it's meaningful. I find working with all age groups and my students right now, if, if they aren't enjoying the collaborative process, it's going to feel like I'm pushing and shoving them over the finish line. Um, meaningful collaboration should be fun. It should be enjoyable for the students and for you as the facilitator in the room. So thinking through these elements, um, let's look at some examples. Um, something to keep an eye, I, I'm going to reiterate what I shared just a moment ago. When it comes to this transitional time, I think a lot of people or some people, they may be, um, they may be tempted to just throw everything out the window and pick and pull the, the interesting, engaging things that they're seeing. Um, offered by other art teachers via social media. And that, as a, a tech enthusiast, enthusiast, I will often have to keep myself in check because I'll see something so cool or a tour that's so interesting and I wanna plug it right into my class. But then I stop myself and I think, oh, okay, is this something that I really need to introduce students to right now? How does it fit into the broader scope and sequence that we're working with at this particular point of the year? Even with this transition, where do I want my students to be at at the end of the year? Is it gonna serve those goals? So I have a, I have a whole Google document of cool things that I see. I drop, um, if I see something cool, but I know I can't use it in the immediate moment, I'll drop it into that folder. Um, you can keep things simple, you can keep things engaging while still being aligned with your curriculum. I encourage you to really think through that. Um, consider what students have access to at home. When it comes to the assignment piece, the tangible things that students are going to be creating, I know that some teachers were in a position where their schools were still open a couple of days ago and students were able to come and get supplies and pull things from their lockers. And I know some of you, that is not the situation where all, this happened all of a sudden, you hardly have anything at home yourself, let alone your students. So thinking about scope and sequence, say you had, you know, a perspective uh, a, a observational painting on deck. Students can still do some observational drawing with paper and pencil. You can get down to the basics of things. Um, maybe students do have a device and a stylus or an Apple pencil and they can do a lot of things digitally. Think through all of those op options, but think bare bones um, if needed. The link here that you'll find in the PDF that we share at the end is a tip for photographing artwork. Um, so students who are working with just computer paper and a pencil at home, or maybe they did happen to grab their sketchbook that last day of school, um, the, that handout, it's a one pager that has some really nice tips that you can share with students when it comes to taking a photograph of their artwork so they can add it to the LMS or they can link it to your Google folder that you've set up for them. Um, it might not be the best photograph, um, but you can give them some small tips on lighting and angles so that you can get a pretty clear picture of what they've created on their own. 
also keeping it simple, but also keeping it main, meaningful. There's so much that you can do. I mentioned that sketchbook. Here's, um, here's several different resources with lots of sketchbook prompts that could start out as a sketchbook prompt and then very easily turn into a unit of instruction. Um, these are great starting points for you as you're kind of aligning, again, your original plan for the year and making small tweaks to make that happen in an online capacity. If you are in a situation where students have devices at home, whether it is an iPad, a, another kind of tablet, or even their cell phone, um, I, for one, I'm terrible at creating drawings on my cell phone. I need to have my, my iPad to create, I think, my vision. Um, but some students, they really enjoy working with their iPhone. Here's a couple, just a few free apps if students don't have um, apps set up on their devices that they could take a look at. Um, I want to emphasize the free because I'm just not sure of everyone's situation. You know, if they have a school issued iPad, it might be difficult for students to add, um, add apps, let alone paid apps to those devices. And if they're working with their own devices, some free options are really great. Um, I do have a couple of my favorite paid ones there. If you don't use them now, make note for later. I'm a huge Procreate person, so I have to give props to those developers. In addition to painting and drawing apps, um, I mentioned the cell phone. Students can make some really wonderful photographic work with their cell phone. These are a couple of the free apps that I have on my devices across the board to keep students making and thinking about um, just how they visually communicate. Even if students aren't um, going a lot of places to photograph, you can do some interesting things with photo hunts around the home. I would encourage now that it's getting a little bit nicer in spring, um, some, some nature walks where they can go out and do some really nice photographic work. And here, these next couple of slides, we are just throwing tons of resources your way in, a, in hopes that some of these resources would, would align with your original scope and sequence, your original curriculum plans, and pave ways for some really nice revisions to that scope and sequence to shift to an online mindset. So we've got resources, just general art resources here, some that you probably are familiar with like Google Arts and Culture, um, but the Art Institute of Chicago is one example that has a ton of art related lesson plans and resources online, um, check it out. I also recently in the art resources list added the university art classes link here. This would be a really good link to share with maybe some, some of your AP students who are in this phase where they're still needing to create quality work for their portfolios. Um, and this would also give you an opportunity to change up voice. So you're going to be giving those students your mentorship, but there's also these university professors that are opening up their classrooms and their expertise to give advice to students. Um, we also have Artists Online, Art21 has some great, great resources, and I'm sure you've seen Lunch Doodles. I've fallen in love with Lunch Doodles. Um, there's a lot of artists that are joining on the bandwagon and lending a hand and making art regularly with students. Um, we've got some virtual museum lists. There was a slide earlier with a ton of applications and websites. These three resources, the, the second two resources, 10 amazing virtual tours and 12 world-class museums, when you click on that, it's not just one, I mean, there's a ton of resources within each of those articles. Take a look at some of those tours, see what's applicable to your students in the upcoming weeks. Um, the first resource, Make a Virtual Museum Google Slide. This is a really interesting resource because it, it 
can engage you in creating a virtual museum for your students if you're trying to think through ways of going through art history concepts that you were going to do with your students when you were face to face or if you're wanting students to create a virtual museum of their own it can go both ways you could use it as a teacher resource or as a really meaningful assignment for students and the list goes on literally guys we've got animal live streams if you're doing animal art um, we've got virtual field trips we've got the kennedy center Na national parks storyline is a favorite with celebrities reading through books i will often read books through video to my students as well um, there's so many cross-curricular connections out there these are just a few to get you started um, and then I think this is the final slide of resources. We've got some music videos and cartoons. I've added a little bonus at, in the lower left-hand corner, a Mr. Bean video. Not suitable for all learners, but for, the, for those of you in the room that just need to sit and laugh um, about all of this stuff going on, that's a, that's a fun video. Um, also, something to think about as you're engaging students in content and hopefully that content inspires some really cool, really interesting art making on the students part. The next thing to think about from the teacher lens is, okay, one, how are they going to turn in that work? Probably through an LMS, probably through an, an assignment um, folder. But also think about, there, this is a really good opportunity to play a little advocacy. Um, so this article, it's just a fun article if you haven't read it or not. Um, it, it showcases a parent that came across a piece of artwork that was drawn on their wall <laughs> and not intent, not on their, not in, intended. Um, but something that sparked to me when I read this article is, okay you have all of these art students at home with their families you're ha engaging them in art making why not ask them to put up a little art display a little art gallery in their homes they're going to be sharing their work digitally but let's encourage them to celebrate it physically with the people that are immediately around them um, through an, a mini art show and so if you take that approach um, there's some really interesting things that you could do with talking about art and critiquing art with families so say you have students share their artwork with you in your lms in your classroom so you and their peers are talking about their artwork um, but you also have students putting it up in their homes and then asking their families to talk about the artwork I've linked a couple of things. Um, the Printable Question Cards is a wonderful resource from the Art Class Curator. Art Class Curator, that's a website you're gonna wanna follow in the upcoming days. I know they have some great things percolating for art teachers in your situation. And what I've done here is I've taken several of the printable question cards. They're just questions to talk about art and I've added them to a Google slide deck for you, which you could do, you could make a copy and do whatever you want with it. Um, maybe you share that with students and they use that as a, as a conversation deck. They hang their artwork on the wall and then they ask their family members, what's going on in this artwork? What do you see? How does it make you feel? Um, on the lower right, there's a digital element to this. Maybe you actually get students recording their family members' conversations about the artwork. Here, I've created a voice thread deck with these cards. So students, they could share their artwork with um, family members that then voice record their response, type their response to the questions, the other cool thing about VoiceThread, you'll see that there's a little phone icon. The students, they could add their actual art to this deck and then call up grandma, call up an aunt or an uncle that's in another place, share their artwork with them and have a, a conversation through the digital tool to talk through the artwork. 
So again, looking for little simple ways that can humanize this experience for students will be really important. The other thing that we need to think about is really how are you taking care of you as the teacher? Um, you have been thrown into this situation. Um, your situation might be changing on a daily basis. You might get an email saying, this is all changing. You've planned this, now you need to go to this. So there's so many things that are changing for you. Um, and it's one of the questions that I asked my students in that feedback, my first feedback form was really, what are you doing to take care of you? Um, so just my biggest thing that I've been able to do this week is as I'm working and kind of preparing for today um, and trying to wrap up some things for last week is I set myself a timer on my computer. Like I need 25 minutes of solid work time and then I can do something else. Um, so that I'm just kind of staying in that routine that I have thrived with as a teacher and I'm sure you have as well. Uh, my world changes every 45 minutes. And when you give me the whole day to work from home, I need to kind of provide myself some of that structure. So kind of looking at what does my daily schedule look like? How can I kind of stay on target with my tasks and build in time for me to take care of myself? Um, the other thing that I found to be helpful is Facebook groups are really helpful. Twitter is really helpful but I found sometimes I just need a break. So I think giving yourself like, okay, I need to stop and go do something else before I go down the kind of crazy rabbit hole um, too far in social media, especially right before bed when you're just trying to kind of take time for yourself. Um, I have seen a lot of posts about what are you doing as an art teacher and document this time, keep a journal, do some things for yourself. Um, and then the other thing with that is um, I'm posting things that I'm doing on my school Instagram, which is usually pictures of students working. Um, the other day I posted a picture of me just like gessoing my canvas, like something really small, but it was a way for kids to connect and see that I'm doing something creative. And then it kind of holds me accountable and I've given myself permission. I don't need to work 24 seven. I can be creative, whether it's with knitting, whether it's with a painting, um, but just setting up that time and space for you because you need to also take care of you so that you can help everybody in your family. I think that's really important. And I think as teachers, we are not good at that. So that would be my biggest thing is making sure that you are taking time to get outside to do some things for you, I think is important. I will self-proclaim, Carrie, I'm terrible at that. And as someone who has bounced between being in the K-12 classroom and being face-to-face -face with college students and then also being totally online, when I'm in a totally on my online teaching mindset, it is very easy for me to go the whole time. Um, and for me, the timer is key, making sure I'm setting a timer so I do have a lunch break at some point. I do take pauses to get up and move around. Um, I also try to limit my work to my office here. So when I, when I go, when I open this door and I exit, that's when I'm going home in my mind. I'm going home to my husband, to dinner, um, to that time. Um, when, you're, when you're teaching in a classroom, you have that natural separation. When you cl click off the lights to your classroom and you close that door, you need to figure out that same process in this new mindset because otherwise you're going to work constantly. Um, and that kind of brings us to this next slide of consideration, something that I've been doing a lot for, for a while, not just because of the time we're in, but I'm so grateful I've gotten into a bit of a practice here. Um, find some mindful practice activities. If that's something that you're interested in, if that's your jam, get into it. Um, I have an Apple Watch and I've set myself reminders to, um, take some, some moments and do some breathing activities. This um, article has some really nice ideas. 
We also link to some resources for you here. And these are resources not only for you as the adult trying to manage all of this craziness that's going on, but it's also, there are also resources that you can introduce to your kids. Um, if, if you think students or your students would be receptive to some mindful activities. Something that I've encouraged some of my recent graduates who are in the same position as you guys are, um, think about adding, as I think about my weekly or daily modules for my students, I, I will be adding a, it's not a required step, but an encouraged mindfulness step to each of my modules so that my students, before they sit down to the video that I've created or the article I want them to read, they have an opportunity to stop, breathe, and just take that moment to transition. Um, and as I think about K-12 students who are at home, and they're spending a lot of time maybe in front of their computer or their tablet with their e-learning. Um, you know, in a high school or middle, middle school session, physically they would be moving from classroom to classroom. They would have that natural transition time to sit and mess about with their friends or have a conversation or go to the water fountain. They might not naturally do that when they're bouncing between your class to this class to that class in an e-learning situation. So assuming that they won't, I like to build in things in my own class to create that sense of transition for them if they're not doing it themselves. So whether it's looking at a wonderful book like this one in front of you um, or, or doing a quick little Zen art activity or maybe, you know, there is an app that you really like using and you encourage your students. I recently saw this mindfulness class for kids pop up and I'm like, I'm linking that for, for today because I think that would be wonderful for us as teachers and also students in this unknown time period. Kind of a wrap up as you think about, I feel like we gave you a ton of information um, and lots of resources. So hopefully you have time to kind of sit and sift through some things. Um, I kind of wanted to make at the end kind of a checklist of things that you need to think about as you move forward um, into this kind of crazy unknown. Um, the first thing is really look at your curriculum, what absolutely needs to stay, and then how can you alter it and make it work online? Uh, really kind of think through those questions. A lot of these like recommendations are really questions for you to think through as you're looking at your own content and what you want your own new classroom to be like. Um, think about how you want to learn it. How do you want your kids to take in the information? Is it articles? Is it videos? Is it websites? Is it all you? Is it stuff that you're finding and linking? What's going to be the best way for your students to learn it? Um, the third thing, how do you want your students to practice these skills? Are they small tasks? Are they big tasks? Are you doing like a virtual, um, like a online worksheet that they need to do? Or is it sketchbook stuff that you want them to practice and then shoot a picture of it? Um, how are they going to prove to you that they've learned it? Is it through a slideshow? Are they photographing their artwork? Are they doing that traditional turn in or are they doing kind of like a similar or a Padlet potential collaboration turn in where they're really starting to get feedback and then connecting with the other one with other students, excuse me, in class. And then the last one is really reflect and ask your students like, is this going well? What more do you need from me? What's not working? and ask them they're going to tell you hey you've given me too much or hey i need more information or this was unclear so if, i think if you ask students they're going to give you what you need as you reflect because we're all in this together so really having your students be a part of that um, is going to provide some ownership to them and carrie you really honed in by saying we're all in this together I've been so impressed by the groups that I have been following in just how the art education community has rallied together to support each other and whatnot. I don't follow a lot of other communities like other subject areas and I and I, I don't know how things are going over there, but I, I know from the art educator perspective, we are all in this together and really helping each other along the way. 
And with that in mind, um, I've mentioned this um, Facebook group. Um, this is um, the Online Art Teachers K through 12 Facebook group. It's a closed group, um, but answer just a couple of questions. Let them know that you're an art teacher and we will let you in. This, this group has been growing so quickly and the conversations that are happening within this space have just been so empowering, but also uplifting and motivational. So you're gonna see in here um, access ideas, lesson ideas, website ideas, it is chock full. Um, and it's been created by Dr. Trina Harlow. I've been helping support, there's a wonderful group of leaders that are supporting and kind of making sure that we're documenting the great, wonderful ideas that are coming through this Facebook page. There's a whole Google Drive with access to lessons and resources for you guys to continue on this journey, this online journey. Um, we're also publishing regular newsletters. So um, I'm gonna link a, well, it's linked here in the PDF PowerPoint that you're gonna get. This is an article with a lot of the ideas that you've seen here, plus more. Um, so if you haven't already joined that group, it's really wonderful. Um, something else that Dr. Harlow, cause she's the, the creator of this group and just, she's been so inspiring. You might've seen her in the, in the webinar yesterday. She's been having some great conversations with the Smithsonian talking about what a unique period we are going through as artists, as art educators, as human beings. And she has been encouraging everyone in the group and wanted me to reiterate for you here um, to be creating artwork of your own in a sketchbook or in, in some sort of place. Um, she is starting conversations, as I said, with the Smithsonian and some other museums to talk about having a potential show for art teachers as they document their experience through this. And we're gonna get to the end at some point of all of this. Let's think about how we can document this experience and celebrate how empowered we're, we are as a community. So that link will take you to the Facebook page um, to join. And something else I also wanna shout out as a previous Art of Education person, I love what they are doing over there. They have um, a webinar coming up this evening. I'm gonna be popping into that as well because I'm learning right alongside you. Um, they're surely gonna have some additional insights and ideas for getting through this very interesting time. And so with that, Carrie and I, we just wanna thank all of you for bearing with us for this extended webinar period. Um, I've just been going and going with the slide deck. I think Carrie, we have a ton of questions we can shift over. We do, there's a ton of questions here. So I'm gonna bounce out of my slide share so that we can address as many of those as we can. And I believe Teresa is still with us. Oh yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, so Rich asked, his first one is how much is too much? And then he also asked if we use, how much we use video to connect with our students, either live or pre-taped. I personally will say I haven't gone live. Um, I just feel like I have four dogs and I have a son at home. There's just too much going on for me to currently go live. I would like to go live, but I'm gonna have to wait till it's nicer outside. Um, the one thing that I have done that I've gotten the best response from is with those notes that I'm sending back to students. So I collected the form, the information in the form and then I asked them, what are they doing to take care of themselves? And in those email responses, I'm kind of responding to what they had said so that they know that I read it. And then I'm also kind of putting what I'm doing in there as well. Um, but for the kids in my um, upper level class that I have a little bit more of a connection with, instead of giving them an email response, I do voice notes and I email them. And the title of my email is Super Secret Notes. I have gotten so many responses like this because kids know that that's what my audio notes are. And I've gotten a lot of things back from them that way. But I don't know how much is too much. I, I really don't, I wish I did. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I, to jump on the video conversation, I think going live is, is really interesting and, and engaging, but I think in this period, it's, really, really difficult to schedule something like that when you know students and families and people will be online. Um, that's why I try to, even in my regular online classes, we, I hardly ever have live in that sort of instance um, videos. I want every, I want everything to be there grabbable. So if a student logs in at seven in the morning or midnight, they have everything that they need to work through the content. And think about it, you're, you're competing with every other teacher that's putting stuff online. So keeping it simple, um, uh, keeping it direct, that's the main mission. Let's see. I'm not familiar with Microsoft and how you would send off materials. Um, I'm guessing that you probably have to have some type of way that you can email students. If you're a Microsoft Cloud Platform, there has to be something. I'm just not familiar with it. Um, I will tell you, I use Wakelet, which is part of the Microsoft package. Um, and that's how I package the rest of my materials for that studio lesson that I did. And I know that is a Microsoft product, so that I know, or not product, but compatible their friends. So I would look at that because it's a really easy, very visual way for kids to engage and you can send that out in an email. So that's pretty simple to do. I see a wonderful recommendation from John. Um, they're using the Calm app weekly before class um, and this, her students are really loving it. Um, I also really enjoy the app Headspace. I believe both Calm and Headspace have special deals for teachers. They might have super special deals in this period. Um, and they always have some free content, but those are two apps that are really nice for teachers and students. I don't, in terms of the AP art, I've also, Dawn, I've been thinking about how are we going to share because I'm not even wanting to think about the fact that my show is going to be canceled. Um, but I have thought about it. I've started putting, having kids send it to me, uh, what they're working on and putting it out on Instagram as they send it to me to try to get kids to see, yes, people are creating, yes, there's something going on. Um, I don't know about the best way to do an online art show, but that's something that is definitely on our mind in our district. Um, so I'm not sure if there's what would be the best format for doing it, but it's something that I'm really thinking about and trying to look for alternatives other than just an Instagram show. But I don't know. But if you come up with something, please share. I don't really have more information than that, but I'm thinking about that. That's heavily on my mind. Um, we have a comment here about online art sub plans, which conjured something um, that Carrie and I were talking about as we were prepping this session. Um, and hopefully this just motivates you to put the time into thinking about the content that you are putting online because the reality is um, it's going to get you through this immediate period, but it could also serve you really well down the road when you are back in the classroom. So maybe after this point, you get into a habit of putting content online that you can potentially share with students that are homesick or they go for a week to Europe with their parents and they're like, what did I miss? Well, here you go. Here's a link to our Google Classroom, what you missed. If anything, hopefully that eases your mind that everything that you create in this moment, you can potentially reuse down the road. It looks like you're typing to someone, Carrie. I am, sorry. I was answering the <laughs> puzzle question because I have used it and it's great. But one of the things, and I guess we didn't touch on it at all here, Mm -hmm. is you need to really think about, is this something that you're grading? Is this something that just becomes a completion check um, and or they're building towards their portfolio? I guess that's something that, and everybody's district is gonna be different, but I think that's something that maybe is on people's minds. So that'd be something that as you're thinking about using Edpuzzle, um, 
what would be the advantage or disadvantage of using it? Is it something that you, they really need to know? Then maybe you are using Edpuzzle and it becomes a check. Um, and I haven't done any attendance, but I know that I've heard a lot of people talk online about how either in a Google Classroom or potentially a Canvas, they're using a discussion question as a way to track attendance. Trying to see what else we have. I'm curious. This is a this is an interesting question. Um, I'm curious how your schools are addressing digital citizenship. What resources are you using to coach the students and teachers in this arena? Um, this is this is a this is a big important question because when I think of digital citizenship, I I think about you know how do we want our students to be acting in this online space. I think um, oh, there's a lot of a lot of transfer. You know, you're you're asking for mutual respect across the board. Um, I've been teaching online for a little while now, and something I have noticed in situations where maybe I will never be face to face with a student, sometimes their means of communication or their manner of communication to me might be a little bit different than I might want. Um, they might be harshly direct in moments. Um, in those instances, I do have in, in my course syllabus, you know, some, some mantras when it comes to digital citizenship. I'll, I'll find a way to share that out with the group. Um, but I think just emphasizing to your classes, hey, remember, I'm a human being on the other side of this. Your peers are human beings on the other side of it. In your situation, going from face-to-face -to, -face to online, you have had an opportunity to humanize and get to know one another. That shouldn't be forgotten only because you're now communicating through a screen. And maybe you create, a, maybe one of your video updates, if you get into a video update modality, maybe one of them is just focused on digital citizenship and how to act within this online space how to be kind to one, one another, but also give really meaningful feedback. It could just be a video on tips in that regard. I think the more transparent you can make and make yourself the better, I think from an instructor lens also, keeping a very close eye on those discussion boards. If you use discussion boards, reading your students' comments, keeping a pulse of how conversation is going. So if you can, if you have those teacher spidey senses, as I like to call them, you can tell when maybe something is burning or starting to conjure up, you can get ahead of it. But if you can't get ahead of it and you come across it, you react to it. Um, you react to it as a class, you react to it on the individual level if needed, and you just really emphasize we need to continue to respect each other. No, I definitely agree with that. And I think that would be a great opportunity to, to have that video introduction and to be clear. Um, luckily, in my digital classes where we do so much online feedback and stuff, my kids know the expectations. So for me, it's going to be just a reminder. Oh, wait, remember, these are our expectations. This is archivable. We need to be professional. All of those things I think are important. But I think with littles and middles, you might need to offer a clear picture of what you're expecting. But then just like you would do in the classroom, I think that when you're seeing those kids do a great job, you are giving them the feedback, hey, we had a great discussion. I saw a lot of great use of vocabulary. So all those things that you would stop a discussion or pause for a discussion in the classroom, I think then as the moderator of that discussion, it's really important that kids see you interacting and seeing you in that discussion so that they know Oh, she is there. She isn't just posting this for us to do so that they make those connections, I think is important. Right. I just responded to a question from Amy about video capture. Um, the video capture I was using was called Panopto. Um, something to keep in mind is that's built into my university's LMS, that being Canvas. 
um, if your school has a subscription to it, take advantage of it because that's the tool that does the automatic captions and it's really pretty intuitive and user friendly. Um, but there's other tools out there for doing video capture. We've linked to some basic ones like QuickTime and some other ones. You'll find all of those in the slide deck. Um, somebody asked me if I would post my questions for just my check-in. I will add those to the presentations. They're really just four simple questions, um, but I think it's a good thing. So I will add those in there just to, for that comparison so that we can all kind of see what direction people are taking, I think is important. Um, Sarah asked, we stopped in the middle of the unit. Um, do you suggest trying to continue online or start something new? For that, I think it really depends on the materials, where kids are at. Like, my kids were just starting a painting like they had their sketches they were ready to go so i tried to send home as many materials as i could but i know that not everybody got them so my message to them was you had a plan how can you stay kind of true to your plan with new materials have fun with it was basically my message to them and i think it depends on your grade level and only you know your students so i hope that helps that question Rich, as I'm looking, um, I, there's a couple more. I just had my students do Gravit um, because we were in the middle of a design unit. So we'll see kind of how that goes. I'm trying to put together some tutorials for using Gravit for illustration. And I know that there's, um, my students have been using some of the Adobe apps on their Chromebooks. Some have worked, some have not worked just because of our Chromebook issue, not because of the app issue. Um, but I've heard of a new one, uh, but I'm going to have to look it up because I haven't had a chance to get it and I'll shoot it to you for photo apps. Sarah, do we have all of our questions covered as you kind of look through them? Well, there's so many questions, so many wonderful questions. Um, and, you know, we might not we might not get to every single question, um, and that's that's okay. I'm going to take. Um, we're in a good place. Yeah, we're we're in a generally good place, and I'm gonna I'm going to copy all of these questions over. I think I think we can pull them from the whole conversation with Teresa's help, and okay. anything that we haven't addressed, we can um, address in some way or another. I, we, we both provide our, and you'll get this at the end of the slide deck as well, my email, Carrie's email, I'm all over the place on social media. Um, if you join the online art teachers K through 12 group, you can have conversations through that. I did see that someone isn't on Facebook and that's okay too. Um, if you're not on Facebook, but would like to get those newsletters from the online Facebook group, shoot me an email with your contact and I will share a folder with you where I'm going to be dropping all of these PDFs so you have access to them. Um, we are all in the spirit of sharing and helping and supporting one another. So please continue to reach out to both of us with questions and we're going to do our very best. Oh, here, I'll drop my, not, my email out there for you all here and um, let's just continue this conversation and i want to thank Teresa and iaea for helping us spread the word even beyond our state um, to help everyone and thank you everyone for joining us this has been a wonderful group of people overwhelming i should say group of people and carrie it's been a pleasure presenting with you yeah this was a lot of fun hopefully we provided some food for thought, some things that people can think about, and then continue this conversation in Hawaii. Continue, uh, this, con continue this conversation wherever you're at throughout your organization, I think is really important uh, because I think right now we're the model for what other content areas should be doing. And I, I guess I don't know if science is having these conversations. They could be, um, but I doubt it. I feel like we're a really strong connected group of people which is why I believe that we're gonna be okay.